Chapter Eleven of the Wheat Princess by Jean Webster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Marcia was awakened the next morning by Bianca knocking at the door with the information that Gervasio wished to get up and that, as his clothes were very ragged, she had taken the liberty the night before of throwing them away. For an instant, Marcia blinked uncomprehendingly. Then, as the events of the evening flashed through her mind, she sat up in bed and solicitously clasping her knees in her hands considered the problem she felt and not without reason that gervasio's future success at the villa depended largely on the impression he made at this his first formal appearance she finally dispatched bianca to try him with one of gerald's suits and to be very sure that his face was clean meanwhile she hurried through with her own dressing in order to be the first to inspect his rehabilitation as she was putting the last touches to her hair she heard a murmur of voices on the terrace and peering out cautiously beheld her uncle and sybert lounging on the parapet engaged with cigarettes she had not been dreaming then those were sybert's steps she had heard the night before she puckered her brow over the puzzle and peered out again whatever had happened last night there was nothing electrical in the air this morning the two had apparently shoved all inflammable subjects behind them and were merely waiting idly until coffee should be served it was a beautifully peaceful spring morning that she looked out upon the two men on the terrace appeared to be in mood with the day careless indifferent loungers nothing more and last night she recalled their low fierce angry tones and the lines in her forehead deepened this was a chameleon world she thought as she stood watching them gervasio for the moment forgotten gerald ran up to the two with some childish prattle which called forth a quick amused laugh sybert stretched out a lazy hand and drew the boy toward him carefully balancing his cigarette on the edge of one of the terra-cotta vases he rose to his feet and tossed the little fellow in the air four or five times gerald screamed with delight and called for more sybert laughingly declined as he resumed his cigarette and his seat on the balustrade the little play recalled marcia to her duty with a shake of her head at matters in general she gave them up and turned her face toward gervasio's quarters bianca was on her knees before the boy giving the last touches to his sailor tie and she turned him slowly around for inspection his appearance was even more promising than marcia had hoped for with his dark curls still damp from their unwanted ablutions clad in one of gerald's baggiest sailor suits of red linen with a rampant white collar and tie except for his bare feet which would not be forced into gerald's shoes he might have been a little princeling himself backed by a hundred noble ancestors marcia sank down on her knees beside him you little dear she exclaimed as she kissed him gervasio was not used to caresses and for a moment he drew back his brown eyes growing wide with wonder then a smile broke over his face and he reached out a timid hand and patted her confidingly on the cheek she kissed him again in pure delight and taking him by the hand set out forthwith for the loggia echo my friends isn't he beautiful she demanded mr copley and sybert sprang to their feet and came forward interestedly who denies now that it's clothes that make the man i can't say but that he was as picturesque last night her uncle returned but he's undoubtedly cleaner this morning where's gerald asked sybert let's see what he has to say of the new arrival gerald who had but just discovered marcellus was delightedly romping in the garden with him and was dragged away under protest and confronted with the stranger he examined him in silence a moment and then remarked he's got my clothes on and suddenly as a terrible idea dawned upon him he burst out is he a new brother cause if he is you can take him away oh my dear his mother remonstrated in horror he's a little italian boy gerald was visibly relieved he examined gervasio again from this new point of view i want to go without my shoes and socks he declared oh but he's going to wear shoes and socks too as soon as we can get some to fit him said marcia do you want to see my lizards gerald asked insinuatingly suddenly making up his mind and pulling gervasio by the sleeve gervasio backed away you must talk to him in italian gerald sybert suggested he's like marietta he doesn't understand anything else i should like to have another look at those lizards myself he added come on gervasio and taking a boy by each hand he strode off toward the fountain 
mrs copley looked after them dubiously but marcia interposed he's a dear little fellow aunt catherine and it will be good for gerald to have some one to play with marcia's right catherine it won't hurt him any and i doubt if the boy's italian is much worse than bianca's thus gervasio's formal installation at the villa for the first week or so his principal activity was eating until he was in the way of becoming as rosy-cheeked as gerald himself during the early stages of his career he was consigned to the kitchen where francois served him with soup and macaroni to the point of bursting later having learned to wield a knife and fork without disaster he was advanced to the nursery where he supped with gerald under the watchful eye of granton taken all in all gervasio proved a valuable addition to the household he was sweet-tempered eager to please and pitifully grateful for the slightest kindness he became gerald's faithful henchman and implicitly obeyed his commands with only an occasional rebellion when they were over oppressive he was quick to learn and it was not long before he was jabbering in a mixture of italian and english with a vocabulary nearly as varied as gerald's own the first week following gervasio's advent was a period of comparative quiet at the villa but one fairly disturbing little contretemps occurred to break the monotony the boy had been promised a reward of sweet chocolate as soon as he should learn to wear shoes and stockings with a smiling face shoes and stockings being in his eyes an objectionable feature of civilization when it came time for payment however marcia discovered that there was no sweet chocolate in the house and not to disappoint him she ordered gerald's pony carriage and taking with her the two boys and a groom set out for castel vivalanti and the baker's had she stopped to think she would have known that to take gervasio to castel vivalanti in broad daylight was not a wise proceeding but it was a frequent characteristic of the copleys that they did their thinking afterward the spectacle of gervasio delano in a carriage with a principino and in new clothes with his face washed very nearly occasioned a mob among his former playmates the carriage was besieged and marcia found it necessary to distribute a considerable largesse of copper before she could rid herself of her following as she laughingly escaped from the crowd and drove out through the gateway a man stepped forward from the corner of the wall and motioned her to stop for a moment a remembrance of her aunt's rencontre with the camerist flashed through her mind and then she smiled as she reflected that it was broad daylight and in full sight of the town she pulled the pony to a standstill and asked him what he wanted he was gervasio's stepfather he said they were poor hard-working people and did not have enough to eat but they were very lonely without the boy and wished to have him back even american princes he added couldn't take poor people's children away without their permission and he finished by insinuating that if he were paid enough he might reconsider the matter marcia did not understand all that he said but as gervasio began to cry and at the same time clasped both hands firmly about the seat in an evident determination to resist all efforts to dislodge him she saw what he meant and replied that she would tell the police but the man evidently thought that he had the upper hand of the situation and that she would rather buy him off than let the boy go with a threatening air he reached out and grasped gervasio roughly by the arm gervasio screamed and marcia before she thought of possible consequences struck the man a sharp blow with the whip and at the same time lashed the pony into a gallop they dashed down the stony road and around the corners at a perilous rate while the man shouted curses from the top of the hill they reached the villa still bubbling with excitement over the adventure and caused mrs copley no little alarm but when marcia greeted her uncle's arrival that night with the story he declared that she had done just right and without waiting for dinner he remounted his horse and galloping back to castel vivalanti rode straight up to the door of the little trattoria where the fellow was engaged in drinking wine and cursing americans there he told him before an interested group of witnesses that gervasio was not his child that since he could not treat him decently he had forfeited all claim to him and that if he tried to levy any further blackmail he would find himself in prison wherewith he wheeled his horse's head about and made a spectacular exit from the town if anything were needed to strengthen gervasio's position with mr copley this incident answered the purpose as a result of the adventure marcia for the time dropped castel vivalanti from her calling list and extended her acquaintance in the other direction she came to be well known as she galloped about the countryside on a satin-coated little sorrel born and bred in kentucky followed by a groom on a thumping cob 
who always respectfully drew up behind her when she stopped as often as she could think of any excuse she visited the peasants in their houses laughing gaily with them over her own queer grammar it was an amused curiosity which at first actuated her friendliness their ingenious comments and naive questions in regard to america proved an ever diverting source of interest but after a little while as she understood them better she grew to like them for their own staunch virtues when she looked about their gloomy little rooms with almost no furnishings except a few copper pots and kettles and a tawdry picture of the madonna and saw what meagre straitened lives they led and yet how bravely they bore them her amusement changed to respect their quick sympathy and warm friendliness awakened an answering spark and it was not long before she had discovered for herself the lovable charm of the italian peasant she explored in the course of her rides many a forgotten little mountain village topping a barren crag of the sabines and held by some roman prince in almost the same feudal tenure as a thousand years ago they were picturesque enough from below these huddling grey stone hamlets shooting up from the solid rock but when she had climbed the steeply winding path and had looked within she found them miserable and desolate beyond belief she was coming to see the underside of a great deal of picturesqueness meanwhile though life was moving in an even groove at villa vivalanti the same could not be said of the rest of italy each day brought fresh reports of rioting throughout the southern provinces and travellers hurrying north reported that every town of any size was under martial law in spite of reassuring newspaper articles written under the eye of the police it was evident that affairs were fast approaching a crisis there was not much anxiety felt in the immediate neighbourhood of rome for the capital was too great a stronghold of the army to be in actual danger from mobs the affair if anything was regarded as a welcome diversion from the tediousness of lent and the embassies and large hotels where the foreigners congregated were animated by a not unpleasurable air of excitement conflicting opinions of every sort were current some shook their heads wisely and said that in their opinion the matter was much more serious than appeared on the surface they should not be surprised to see the scenes of the french commune enacted over again and they intimated further that since it had to happen they were very willing to be on hand in time to see the fun many expressed the belief that the trouble had nothing to do with the price of bread the wheat famine was merely a pretext for stirring up the people it was well known that the universities the younger generation of writers and newspaper men even the ranks of the army were riddled with socialism what more likely than that the socialists and the church adherents had united to overthrow the government intending as soon as their end was accomplished to turn upon each other and fight it out for supremacy it was the opinion of these that the government should have adopted the most drastic measures possible and was doing very foolishly in catering to the populace by putting down the dazio still others held that the government should have abolished the dazio long before and that the people in the south did very well to rise and demand their rights and so the affairs of the unfortunate neapolitans were the subject to conversation at every table d'hote in rome and the forestieri sojourning within the walls derived a large amount of entertainment from the matter marcia copley however had heard little of the gathering trouble she did not read the papers and her uncle did not mention the matter at home he was too sick at heart to dwell on it uselessly and it was not a subject he cared to discuss with his niece his family indeed saw very little of him for he had thrown himself into the work of the foreign relief committee with characteristic energy and he spent the most of his time in rome marcia's interest in sightseeing had come to a sudden halt since the afternoon of tre fontane she had ventured into the city only once and then merely to attend to the purchase of clothes for gervasio the roystons on that occasion had been out when she called at their hotel and her feeling of regret was mingled largely with relief as she left her card and retired in safety to villa vivalanti she had not analyzed her emotions very thoroughly but she felt a decided trepidation at the thought of seeing paul the trepidation however was not altogether an unpleasant sensation the scene in the cloisters had returned to her mind many times and she had taken several brief excursions into the future what would he say the next time they met would he renew the same subject or would he tacitly overlook that afternoon and for the time let everything be as it had been before she hoped that the latter would be the case it would give a certain piquancy to their relations and she was not ready just at present to make up her mind paul on his side had also pondered the question somewhat events were not moving with the rapidity he wished marcia evidently would not come into rome 
and he could think of no valid excuse for going out to the villa his pessimistic forecast of events had proved true holy week found the roystons still in the city treating themselves to orgies of church-going as he followed his aunt from church to church there are in the neighbourhood of three hundred and seventy-five in rome and he says they visited them all that week he indulged in many speculations as to the state of marcia's mind in regard to himself at times he feared he had been over precipitate at others that he had not been precipitate enough his aunt and cousins returned from a flying visit to the villa with the report that marcia had adopted a boy and a dog and was solicitously engaged with their education what did she say about me madge paul boldly inquired she said you were a very impudent fellow margaret retorted and in response to his somewhat startled expression she added more magnanimously you needn't be so vain as to think she said anything about you she never even mentioned your name paul breathed a meditative ah marcia had not mentioned his name it was not such a bad sign that she was thinking about him then if there were no other man and he was vain enough to take her at her word nothing could be better for his cause than a solitary week in the sabine hills he knew from present and past experience that an italian spring is a powerful stimulant for the heart on tuesday of holy week mrs royston wakened slightly from her spiritual trance to observe that she had scarcely seen marcia for as much as a week and that as soon as lent was over they must have the copleys in to luncheon at the hotel where is the use of waiting till lent's over paul had inquired you needn't make it a function just a sort of family affair if you invite them for thursday we can all go together to the tenebrae service at st peter's as this is miss copley's first easter in rome she might be interested accordingly a note arrived at the villa on wednesday morning inviting the family gerald included to breakfast the next day with the roystons in rome on thursday morning an acceptance gerald excluded arrived at the hotel de lourdes et paris and was followed an hour later by the copleys themselves the breakfast went off gaily paul was his most expansive self and the whole table responded to his mood it was with a sense of gratification that marcia saw her uncle who had lately been so grave laughingly exchanging nonsense with the young man she felt though she would scarcely have acknowledged it to herself a certain property right in paul and it pleased her subtly when he pleased other people she sat next to him at the table and occasionally beneath his laughter and persiflage she caught an undertone of meaning so long as they were not alone and he could not go beyond a certain point she found their relations on a distinctly satisfying basis in spite of paul's manoeuvres he did not find himself alone with marcia that afternoon there was always a cousin in attendance mr and mrs copley declining the spectacle of the tenebrae in st peter's they had seen it before left shortly after luncheon as they were leaving mr copley remarked to mrs royston i will entrust my niece to your care and please do not lose sight of her until you put her in my hands for the evening train i wish no more such escapades as we had the other day and to marcia's discomfort the adventures involving the rescue of marcellus and gervasio were recounted in detail for an unexplained reason she would have preferred the story of their origin to remain in darkness paul's face clouded slightly my objections to sybert grow rapidly he remarked in an undertone marcia laughed if you could have seen him he never spoke a word to me all the way out in the train he sat with his arms folded and a frown on his brow like napoleon at moscow paul's face brightened again oh i begin to like him after all he declared toward five o'clock that evening every carriage in the city seemed to be bent for the ponte sant'angelo a casual spectator would never have chosen a religious function as the end of all this confusion in the tangle of narrow streets beyond the bridge the way was almost blocked and such progress as was possible was made at a snail's pace the royston party in two carriages not unnaturally lost each other the carriage containing marcia margaret and paul getting into the jam in the narrow borgo nuovo arrived in the piazza of st peter's with wheels locked with a cardinal's coach the cardinal's coachman and theirs exchanged an unclerical opinion of each other's ability as drivers the cardinal advanced his head from the window with a mildly startled air of reproof and the americans laughed gaily at the situation after a moment of scrutiny the cardinal smiled back and the four disembarked and set out on foot across the piazza leaving the men to sever the difficulty at their leisure 
he proved an unexpectedly cordial person and when they parted on the broad steps he held out of his hand with a friendly smile and after a moment of perplexed hesitation the three gravely shook it in turn do you think we ought to have kissed it marcia inquired i would have done it only i didn't know how paul laughed he knew we weren't of the true faith no right-minded catholic would laugh at nearly spilling a cardinal in the street they stood aside by the central door looking for mrs royston and eleanor and watching the crowd surge past paul was quite insistent that they should go in without the others but marcia was equally insistent that they wait she had an intuitive feeling that there was safety in numbers for a wonder they presently espied mrs royston bearing down upon them a small camp-stool clutched to her portly bosom and eleanor panting along behind a camp-stool in either hand mrs royston caught sight of them with an expression of relief my dears i was afraid i had lost you she gasped we remembered just as we got to the bridge that we hadn't brought any chairs and so we went back for them paul you should have thought of them yourself i suppose we'd better hurry in and get a good place paul patiently possessed himself of the chairs and followed the ladies with a glance at marcia which seemed to say is there this day living a more exemplary nephew and gentleman than i the tenebrae service on holy thursday is the one time in the year when st peter's may be seen at night the great church looms vaster and emptier and more solemn then than at any other time the eye cannot penetrate to the distant dome hidden in shadows the long nave stretches interminably into space the chapel deepens and broaden until they are churches themselves the clustered pillars reach upward till they are lost in the darkness what the eye cannot grasp the imagination seizes upon and the vast interior grows and widens until it seems to stretch out arms to enclose all christendom itself on this one night it does enclose all rome nobility and peasants italians and foreigners those who are of the faith and those who are merely spectators those who come to worship those who come to be amused st peter's receives them all with the same impartiality standing outside it had seemed to them that the whole city had flowed through the doors but within the church was still approximately empty as they walked down the broad nave in the dimness of twilight marcia turned to the young man beside her at first i didn't think st peter's was impressive that is compared to milan and cologne and some of the other cathedrals but it's like the rest of rome it grows and grows until it comes to the whole world he supplied by the bronze baldacchino mrs royston spread her camp-stools and sat down this is the best place we could choose she said contentedly as she folded her hands we shan't be very near the choir but we can hear just as well and we shall have an excellent view of the altar washing and the sacred relics she spoke in the tone of one who is picking out a stall for a theatrical performance from time to time friends of either the Roystons or Marcia drifted up and, having paused to chat a few minutes, passed on, giving place to others. As one group left them with smiles and friendly bows, Marcia turned to Paul, who was standing beside her. "'It's really dreadful,' she said, "'the way the foreigners take possession of Rome. This might as well be a reception at the embassy. If I were the Pope, I would put up a sign on the door of St. Peter's saying, "'No forestieri admitted.' ah but there are no forestieri in the case of st peter's it belongs to all nations marcia smiled at the young man and turned away and as she turned she caught across an intervening stream of heads a face looking in her direction wearing about the eyes a curiously quizzical expression it was the face of a middle-aged woman an interesting face not exactly beautiful but sparkling with intelligence it seemed very familiar to marcia and as her eyes lingered on it a moment the quizzical expression gave place to one of amused friendliness the woman smiled and bowed and passed on marcia bowed vaguely and then it flashed through her mind who it was the lady who wrote the greatest gossip in rome whom she had met at the studio tea so many weeks before she had forgotten all about her unknown friend of that day and now she turned quickly to paul to ask her identity paul was engaged in answering some question of his aunt's and before she could gain his attention again a hush swept over the great interior and everything else was forgotten in the opening chorus of the miserere the twilight had deepened and the great white dome shone dimly far above the blackness of the crowd 
the voices of the papal choir swelled louder and louder in the solemn chant and high and separate and alone rose the clear flute-like treble of the pope's nightingale and as an undertone an accompaniment to the music the shuffle and murmur of thirty thousand listeners rose and fell like the distant beat of surf the candles on the altar showed dimly above their heads as the service continued one by one the lights were extinguished after half an hour or so the waiting and intensity grew wearing the crowd was pressing closer and margaret royston craned her neck vainly trying to discover how many candles remained paul with ready imagination was answering his aunt's questions as to the meaning of the ceremonies margaret turned to marcia poke this young priest in front of me she whispered and ask him in italian how many candles are left the young priest overhearing the words turned around with an amused smile obligingly stood on his tiptoes to look at the altar and replied in english that there were three thank you said margaret i didn't suppose you could talk english i was born in troy new york really she laughed and the two fell to comparing the rival merits of the hudson and the tiber he proved most friendly carefully explaining to the party the significance of the service and the meaning of the different symbols mrs royston looked reproachfully at her nephew whose stories it transpired did not accord with fact you really couldn't expect me to know as much as a professional aunt eleanor he unblushingly expostulated my explanations were more picturesque than his at any rate and if they aren't true they ought to be the last candle was finally out and for a moment the great interior remained in darkness then a noise like the distant rattle of thunder symbolized the rending of the veil and in an instant light sprang out from every arch and pier and dome a long procession of cardinals choristers and acolytes wound singing to the high altar the altar of the world marcia stood by the railing and watched their faces as they filed past they were such thoughtful spiritual kindly faces that her respect for this great power the greatest power in christendom increased momentarily she felt a sort of shame to be there merely as a spectator she looked about at the faces of the peasants and thought what a barren barren existence would be theirs without this church which promised the only joy they could ever hope to have when the ceremony of washing the altar with oil and wine was ended the young priest bade them a friendly good evening he could not wait for the holy relics he said they had supper at the monastery at seven o'clock he hastily added however in response to the smile trembling on margaret's lips not that they are not the true relics and very holy but i have seen them several times before the relics were exhibited to the multitude from st veronica's balcony far above their heads paul whispered to marcia with a little laugh our friend the cardinal would be gratified would he not to see his heretics bowing before st veronica's handkerchief look he added at that peasant woman in her blue skirt and scarlet kerchief she has probably walked fifty miles with her baby strapped to a board i suppose she thinks the child will have good fortune for the rest of his life if he just catches a glimpse of a splinter of the true cross marcia looked at the woman standing beside her a pilgrim from the abruzzi judging from her dress she was raising an illumined face to the little balcony where the priest was holding above their heads the holy relic in her arms she held a baby whose face she was turning upward also while she murmured prayers in his ears marcia's glance wandered away over the crowd the poor pilgrim peasants whose upturned faces worn by work and poverty were softened for the moment into a holy awe then she raised her eyes to the balcony where the priest in his white robes was holding high above his head the shining silver cross in which was encased st peter's dearest relic the tiny splinter of the true cross the light was centred on the little balcony every eye in the great concourse was fixed upon it the priest was fat his face was red his attitude theatrical the whole spectacle was theatrical a quick revulsion of feeling passed over her a few moments before as she watched the procession of cardinals she had been ready to admit the spiritual significance of the scene now she saw only its spectacular side it was merely a play a delusion got up to dazzle the poor peasants this church was the only thing they had in life and after all what did it do for them what could st veronica's handkerchief what could a splinter of the true cross do to brighten their lives it was superstition not religion that was being offered to the peasants of italy she looked again across a sea of upturned faces and shook her head isn't it pitiful she asked 
isn't it picturesque echoed paul that priest up there knows he's deluding all these people and he's just as solemn as if he believed in the relics himself the church is still so hopelessly medieval that's the beauty of the church paul objected it's still medieval while the rest of the world is so hopelessly nineteenth century i like to see these peasants believing in st veronica's handkerchief and the power of the sacred bambino to cure disease i think it's beautiful exhibition of faith in a world where faith is out of fashion i don't blame the priest in the least for keeping it up it's a protest against the age they're about the only artists left if i were a priest i'd learn prestidigitation and substantiate the efficacy of the relics with a miracle or so it's simply fostering superstition take their superstition away and you deprive them of their most picturesque quality you don't care for anything but what's picturesque she exclaimed in a tone half scornful paul did not answer the ceremony was over and the crowd was beginning to pour out they turned with the stream and wedged their way toward the right-hand entrance near which their carriages were waiting paul manoeuvred very adroitly so that the crowd should separate them from the rest of the party at the door i will tell you what i care for most he said in her ear as they pushed out into the portico i care for you she perceived his drift too late and looked back with an air of dismay the others were lost in the moving mass of heads paul saw her glance and laughed you're going to take good care that we shan't be alone together aren't you marcia echoed his laugh yes she acknowledged frankly i'm trying to it doesn't matter my time's coming you can't put it off his hand touched hers hanging at her side and he clasped it firmly come here we'll get out of this crowd and he pushed on outside and drew back into a corner by one of the tall columns the crowd surged past flowing down the steps like a river widening to the sea below them the piazza black with the tossing moving mass of carriages and people the mass of the vatican at their left loomed a black bulk in the night its hundreds of windows shining in the reflected lights of the piazza like the eyes of a great octopus at another time marcia might have looked very curiously toward the palace she might have wondered if in one of those dark windows leo was not standing brooding over the throng of worshippers who had come that day how must a pope feel to see thirty thousand people go out from under his roof go out freely to their homes while he alone may not step across the threshold at another time she would have paused to play a little with the thought but now her attention was engaged paul still held her hand he squared himself in front of her with his back to the crowd have you been thinking about what i asked you had she been thinking she had been doing nothing else she looked at him reproachfully let's not talk about it the more i think the more i don't know that's an unfortunate state to be in perhaps i can help you to make up your mind are you going to be in love with me some day marcia soon he persisted i-i don't know he leaned toward her with his face very close to hers she shrank back further into the shadow there they are she exclaimed as she caught sight of eleanor's head above the crowd and she tried to draw her hand away never mind them they won't be here for three minutes you've got time enough to answer me please not now paul she whispered when he insisted keeping a firm hold of her hand the next time i see you yes perhaps and she turned away to greet the others End of chapter 11chapter 12 of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain the week following easter proved rainy and disagreeable it was not a cheerful period for the villa turned out to be a fair weather house the stone walls seemed to absorb and retain the moisture like a vault and a mortuary atmosphere hung about the rooms mr copley with masculine imperviousness to mud and water succeeded in escaping from the dampness of his home by journeying daily to the ever luring embassy but his wife and niece more solicitous on the subject of hair and clothes remained storm-bound and on the fourth day mrs copley's conversation turned frequently to malaria marcia who had taken the villa for better for worse steadfastly endeavoured to approve of it in even this uncheerful mood she divided her time between romping through the big rooms with gerald gervasio and marcellus and shivering over a brazier full of coals in her own room 
to the accompaniment of dripping ilex trees and the superfluous splashing of the fountain her book was the egoist and the egoist is an illuminating work to a young woman in marcia's frame of mind it makes her hesitate she knew that paul dessart in no wise resembled the magnificent sir willoughby and that it was unfair to make the comparison but still she made it as she stood by the window gazing down on the rain-swept campagna she pondered the situation and pondered it again and succeeded only in working herself into a state of deeper indecision paul was interesting attractive as her uncle said decorative but was he any more or was that enough should she be sorry if she said no should she be sorrier if she said yes so her mind busied itself to the dripping of the raindrops and for all the thought she spent upon the question she wandered in a circle and finished where she had started the monday following easter week dawned clear and bright again marcia opened her eyes to a bar of sunlight streaming in at the eastern window and the first sound that greeted her was a joyful chorus of bird voices she sat up and viewed the weather with a sense of reawakened life feeling as if her perplexities had somehow vanished with the rain she was no nearer making up her mind than she had been the day before but she was quite contented to let it stay unmade a little longer the sound of horses hoofs beneath her window told her that her uncle had started for the station when he was away and there were no guests in the house marcia and mrs copley usually had the first breakfast served in their rooms accordingly as she heard her uncle gallop off she made a leisurely toilet and then ate her coffee and rolls and marmalade at a little table set on the balcony it was late when she joined her aunt on the loggia mrs copley looked up from an intricate piece of embroidery good morning marcia she said returning her niece's greeting yes isn't it a relief to see some sunshine again i have a surprise for you she added a surprise asked marcia my birthday isn't coming for two weeks but never mind surprises are always welcome what is it it isn't a very big surprise just a tiny one to break the monotony of these four days of rain i had a note from mrs royston this morning it should have come yesterday only it was so wet that angelo didn't go for the mail she paused to rummage through the basket of silks i thought it was here but no matter she says that owing to these dreadful riots they have changed all their plans they have entirely given up naples and are going north instead on a little trip of a week or so to assisi and perugia she wrote to say good-bye and to tell me that they would get back to rome in time for your party though they are afraid they can't spend more than two or three days with us then as the change of plan involves some hurry they leave on wednesday that is too bad said marcia and with the words she uttered a sigh of relief paul would go with them probably or at any rate she need not see him it would postpone the difficulty but where is the surprise she inquired oh the surprise mrs copley laughed i entirely forgot it i was afraid they might think it strange that i hadn't answered the note though i really didn't get it in time so i asked your uncle to stop at their hotel and invite them all to come out to the villa for the night i thought that since we were planning to drive to the festa at genazzano to-morrow it would be nice to have them with us i am sure they would be interested in seeing the festa marcia dropped limply into a chair and looked at her aunt is mr dessart coming too i invited him certainly what's the matter aren't you pleased i thought you liked him oh yes i do only i wish i'd got up earlier and then she laughed the situation was rather funny after all she might as well make the best of it suppose we send over to palestrina and invite m benoit for dinner she suggested presently i think he is stopping there this week and it would be nice to have him i suspect she added that he is a tiny bit interested in eleanor a note was sent by a groom who returned with the information that he had found the gentleman sitting on a rock in a field painting a portrait of a sheep that he had delivered the note and got this in return this was a rapid sketch on bristol board representing the young frenchman in evening clothes making a bow with his hand on his heart to the two ladies who received him on the steps of the loggia while a clock in the corner pointed to eight marcia looked at the sketch and laughed here's an original acceptance aunt catherine mrs copley smiled appreciatively he seems to be a very original young man she conceded naturellement he's a prix de rome when frenchmen are nice they are very nice said mrs copley but when they are not words failed her and she picked up her embroidery again at the midday breakfast marcia announced rather hopefully 
that she did not think the Roystons would come. Why not? her aunt inquired. They've lost their maid, and there won't be anybody to help them pack. If they come out to the villa tonight, they won't be ready to start for Perugia on Wednesday. Besides, Mrs. Royston never likes to do anything on the spur of the moment. She likes to plan her program a week ahead and stick to it. Oh, I know they won't come, she added with a laugh. Monsieur Benoit will be the only guest after all. And I've ordered dinner for eight, said Mrs. Copley pathetically. I am thinking of driving over to the Contessa's this afternoon. I might invite her to join us. Oh, no, Aunt Catherine, please, not to-day. If the Roystons should come, there'll be a big enough party without her, and, anyway, she wouldn't be particularly interested. Mr. Sybert isn't here. The Contessa comes to see us, not Mr. Sybert, Mrs. Copley returned, with a touch of asperity. Marcia smiled into her cup of chocolate and said nothing. While the sun was sunk in its noonday torpor, she stood by her window, gazing absently off toward the old monastery, engaged in a last valiant struggle to make up her mind. She finally turned away with an impatient shrug, which banished Paul de Sartre and his importunities to the bottom of the Dead Sea. There was no use in bothering any more about it now. Mrs. Royston's mind at least was no weathercock. Marcia clung tenaciously to the hope that they would not come. It was a beautiful afternoon, fresh and sparkling from the week of rain, and she suddenly decided upon a horseback ride to brush from her mind all bothersome questions. She got out her riding habit and jerked the bell-rope with a force which set bells jangling wildly through the house, and brought Granton as nearly on a run as was consonant with her dignity and years. "'It's nothing serious,' Marcia laughed in response to the maid's anxious face. "'I just made up my mind to go for a ride, and in the first flush of energy I ran louder than I meant. It's a great thing, Granton, to get your mind made up about even so unimportant a matter as a horseback ride.' "'Yes, miss.' granton agreed somewhat vaguely as she knelt down to help with the boot how in the world do those soldiers in the king's guard ever get their boots on marcia asked i don't know miss said granton patiently marcia laughed send word to the stables for angelo to bring the horses in fifteen minutes i'm going to take a long ride and i must start immediately very well miss immediately marcia called after her in dealing with angelo reiteration was necessary he was an italian and he still had to learn the value of time she tied her stock before the glass in a very mannish fashion adjusted her hat with the least perceptible tilt and catching up her whip and gloves started out gaily humming a snatch of a very much reiterated neapolitan street song yamo anna copa yamo ya funiculi funicula it ended in a series of trills she did not know the words at the head of the stair she met granton returning granton stood primly expressionless waiting patiently for her to have done before venturing to speak marcia completed her measure and broke off with a laugh well granton what's the matter angelo has taken master gerald's pony to palestrina to be shod and both of the carriages are to be used so the other men will be needed for them and there isn't any one left to ride with you marcia's smile changed to a frown how stupid angelo has no business to go off without saying anything mr copley left orders for him to have the pony shod he's not mr copley's groom he's mine yes miss said granton marcia went on slowly downstairs her frown gathering volume as she proceeded she wished to take a horseback ride and she wished nothing else for the moment she foresaw that her aunt would propose that she ride into tivoli and take tea with the contessa if there was one thing she hated it was to ride at a steady jog trot beside the carriage and if there was a second thing it was to take tea with the contessa she heard mrs copley's and gerald's voices in the salon and she advanced to the doorway aunt catherine i'm furious this is the first time in four days that it has stopped raining long enough for me to go out and i'm dying to take a gallop in the country that miserable angelo has gone off with gerald's pony and there isn't another man on the place that can go with me you needn't propose my riding into tivoli to take tea with the contessa for i won't do it she delivered this outburst from the threshold and as she advanced into the room she was slightly disconcerted to see laurence sybert lazily pulling himself from a chair to greet her if she ever showed in a particularly bad light sybert was sure to be at hand he bowed his face politely grave 
but there was the provoking suggestion of a smile not far below the surface and as she looked at him marcia had the uncomfortable feeling that her own face was growing red i am sorry about angelo my dear said mrs copley i didn't know that you wanted to ride this afternoon but here is mr sybert who has come out to see your uncle and your uncle won't be back till evening i'm sure he will be glad to go with you marcia glanced back at her aunt with an expression which said oh aunt catherine wait till i get you alone certainly miss marcia i should be delighted to fill the recreant angelo's place he affirmed but in a tone which to her ear did not express any undue eagerness thank you mr sybert she smiled sweetly you are very kind but i shouldn't think of troubling you i know that aunt catherine would like to have you go with her to call on the contessa if you will permit it miss marcia i will ride with you instead for though i should be happy to call on contessa torranieri with mrs copley i have just driven out from tivoli and by way of change i should prefer not driving back it's awfully kind of you to offer but i don't really want to ride i was just cross with angelo for going off without saying anything marcia remonstrated mrs copley that doesn't sound polite sybert laughed there is nothing miss marcia he declared that would give me more pleasure this afternoon than a gallop with you and with your permission he touched the bell marcia shrugged her shoulders and gave the order as pietro appeared send word to the stables for kentucky lil and triumvirate to be saddled at once you may go upstairs and borrow as much of howard's wardrobe as you wish said mrs copley i dare say you did not come prepared to play the part of groom i'll try not to get them muddier than necessary he promised as he turned toward the stairs he reappeared shortly in corduroys and leather putties marcia was leaning on the loggia balustrade idly watching the hills while a diminutive stable-boy slowly led the horses back and forth in the driveway sybert helped her mount without a word and they galloped down the avenue in silence he appreciated the fact that she would have preferred staying at home to accepting his escort and the situation promised some slight entertainment a man inclined to be a trifle sardonic can find considerable amusement in the spectacle of a pretty girl who does not wish to talk to him but finds herself in a position where she cannot escape as sybert had been passing a very hard week he was the more willing to enjoy a little relaxation at marcia's expense they pulled their horses to a walk at the gateway and sybert looked at her interrogatively she took the lead and turned to the left along the winding roadway that led up into the mountains away from the via prinestina he rode up beside her again and they galloped on without speaking marcia did not propose to take the initiative in any conversation he could introduce a subject if he wished otherwise they would keep still for the first mile or so he maintained the stolid reserve of a well-trained groom but finally as they slowed the horses to a walk on the steep hillside he broke the silence are we going anywhere or just riding for pleasure just for pleasure he waited until they had reached the top of the hill before renewing the conversation then it is a pleasant day he observed marcia regarded the landscape critically very pleasant she acquiesced looks a little like rain however he added anxiously fixing his eye on a small cloud on the horizon marcia studied the sky a moment with a heroic effort at seriousness and then she began to laugh i suppose we might as well make the best of it she remarked philosophy is the wisest way he agreed have you seen gervasio i have not yet paid my respects to him he is well i trust he is simply a walking appetite i thought he showed a tendency that way mrs copley says that you have been suffering persecution for his sake did she tell you about his stepfather that's my story she ought to have left it for me i can tell it much more dramatically it was quite an adventure wasn't it it was and you got off easily it might have turned out to be more of an adventure than you would have cared for oh i like adventures when they're ended safely yes but these italian peasants are a revengeful lot when they get it into their heads that they have been mistreated i don't believe you ought to drive about the country that way i should think that two boys and a groom might be escort enough the pony carriage doesn't accommodate many more nevertheless joking apart i don't think it is safe the country's pretty thoroughly stirred up just at present you're as bad as aunt catherine with her tattooed man as for being afraid of these peasants i know every soul in castel vivalanti and they're all adorable with the exception of gervasio's relatives if i were your uncle he observed 
i should prefer a niece readier to take suggestions i am ready to take his suggestions but you're not my uncle no said sybert i am not and-and what marcia asked he laughed i believe we declared an amnesty did we not do you think it is best to reopen hostilities it strikes me that there has been more or less light skirmishing in spite of the amnesty at least there has been no serious damage done on either side i would suggest if heavy firing is to be recommenced that we postpone it until the ride home very well let's talk some more about the weather it seems to be the only subject on which we can agree sybert bowed gravely it's been rather rainy for the last week very the villa must have been a little damp very and rather monotonous very marcia laughed and gave the dialogue a new turn i spent the time reading indeed the egoist meredith don't you find him a trifle er for rainy weather you know i found the egoist she returned a most suggestive work it throws interesting sidelights on the men one knows oh come miss marcia he remonstrated that's hardly fair you slander us you mustn't blame me you must blame the author it's a man who wrote it he should be regarded as a traitor in case he is captured and brought into camp i shall order him shot at sunrise he doesn't accuse all men of being sir willoughby's she returned soothingly i hadn't thought of you in exactly that connection if you choose to wear the coat you have to put it on yourself we'll say then that it doesn't fit and i'll resemble the other fellow the daniel deronda one what's his name whitfield whitford whitford it will be remembered was the dark horse who came in at the finish and captured the heroine marcia laughed i really can't say that the other fits any better i'm afraid you're not in the book mr sybert they came to a fork in the roads and drew rein again which way he asked she paused and looked about they were already far up in the mountains and towering ahead nearer and clearer now on the crest of a still higher ridge rose the old monastery she could see from her window she pointed with her whip to the gaunt pile of grey stone against the sky is that your destination he asked is it too far i've been wanting to see it closer ever since we came to the villa he studied the distance i should judge it's about seven kilometres in a straight line but there's no telling how long the road takes to get there we can try it though and if you're not in a hurry to get home we may reach it at any rate there's nothing to prevent our turning back if we find it's too far she suggested oh yes one can always turn back he agreed one can always turn back the words caught marcia's attention and she repeated them to herself they seemed to carry an inner meaning and she commenced weighing anew her feelings toward paul could she turn back was it not too late no if she were on the wrong road the sooner the better but was she on the wrong road there were no guide-posts the end was hidden by a turning she rode on forgetting to talk with a shadow on her face and a serious light in her eyes well sybert inquired would you like my advice i'm afraid it's not a matter you can help me with she returned with a quick laugh they pushed up farther up into the hills between groves of twisted olive trees and sloping vineyards through fields dyed blue and scarlet with forget-me-nots and poppies all nature was green and glistening after the rain and the mountain breeze blew fresh against their faces neither could be insensible to the influence of the day their talk was light and free and glancing mere badinage but it occasionally struck a deeper note and holding for an instant half reluctantly let it go marcia had never known sybert in this mood she had not as she realized known him in any in all their casual intercourse of the past few months they had scarcely exchanged a single idea he was an unexplored country and his character held for her the attraction of the unknown sybert on his side glanced at her curiously from time to time as she flung back a quick reply with him first impressions died hard he had first seen marcia at a tea the centre of a laughing group with all the room paying court to her she was pretty and attractive faultlessly gowned thoroughly at ease he had in his thirteen seasons met many women who played many parts and the somewhat cynical conclusion he had carried away from the experience was that if a woman be but young and fair she has the gift to know it 
but as he watched her now he wondered suddenly if she were quite what he had thought her it struck him that what he had regarded as over-sophistication was rather the pseudo-sophistication of youth her occasional crudeness but the crudeness that comes back from lack of experience she knew nothing of life outside the carefully closed confines of her own small world and yet he recognized in her a certain reckless spirit of daring of curiosity toward the world that responded to a chord in his own nature he had seen it the night they found gervasio it was in her face now as she galloped along against the wind with her eyes raised to the half-ruined towers of the medieval monastery he had not been very lenient toward her he knew and her scarcely veiled antagonism had amused him he felt now as he watched her a momentary impulse to draw her out to mould the direction of her thoughts to turn her face a new way after a wild gallop along the crest of a hill she drew up laughing to steady her hair which threatened to come tumbling down about her ears she dropped the rein loosely on the horse's neck in order to leave both hands free and sybert reached over and took it see here young lady he remonstrated you're going to take a cropper some day if you ride like that she glanced back with a quick retort on her lips but his expression disarmed her he was not watching her with his usual critical look she changed the words into a laugh do you know what you make me feel like doing mr sybert giving lil the reins and galloping down that hill there with my hands in the air perhaps i would be better to keep the reins in my own hands was his cool proposition i never knew any one who could rouse so much latent antagonism in a person as you can you never say a word but i feel like doing exactly the opposite it's well to know it i shall frame my future suggestions accordingly marcia settled her hat and stretched out her hand he returned the reins with a show of doubt can i trust you to restrain your impulses he inquired with his eyes on the declivity before them she gathered up the reins but made no movement to go on instead she half turned in the saddle and looked behind they were on the shoulder of a mountain below them smaller foothills receded tier below tier until they sank imperceptibly into the level plain of the campagna ahead of them the bare sabines stretched in broken ridges backed in the distance by two snow peaks of the apennines everywhere was the warmth of colouring the brilliant hues of an italian spring italy is beautiful isn't it marcia asked simply yes he agreed italy is cursed with beauty she turned her eyes inquiringly from the landscape to him a nation of artists models he exclaimed half contemptuously because of their fatal good looks the italians can't be allowed to be prosperous like any other people perhaps she suggested their beauty is a compensation they are poor i know but don't you think they know how to be happy in spite of it they are too easily happy that's another curse but you surely don't want them to be unhappy she remonstrated since they have to be poor shouldn't you rather see them contented certainly not they have nothing to be contented with but i don't see that it makes any difference what you are contented with so long as you are contented he looked at her with a half smile nonsense miss marcia you know better than that when people are contented with their lot does their lot ever improve do you think the italian people ought to be happy you have seen the way they live or no he broke off you don't know anything about it yes i do she returned i know they're poor horribly poor but they seem to get a good deal of pleasure out of life in spite of it he shook his head you can't convince me with that argument have you never heard of a holy discontent that's what these people need and he added grimly some of them have got it a holy discontent she repeated what a terrible thing to have it's like living for revenge oh well he shrugged a man must live for something besides his three meals a day he can live for his family she suggested yes if he has one otherwise he must live for an idea she glanced at him sidewise she would have liked to ask what idea he lived for but it was a question she did not dare to put instead she commented it's queer isn't it how the ideas that men used to live for have passed away chivalry and crusading and going to war and living as hermits i really don't see what's left the most of the old ideals are exploded he agreed but we have new ones to-day sufficiently bad 
to meet the needs of the present century a man can make a god of his business for instance marcia shifted her seat a trifle uneasily as she thought of her father who certainly did make a god of his business it may have struck sybert that it was not a propitious subject for he added almost instantly and there's always art to fall back upon but you don't object to that she remonstrated no it's good enough in its way he agreed but it doesn't go very deep artists would tell you then that it isn't the true art i dare say he shrugged but at best there are a good many truer things what for instance well three meals a day marcia laughed and then she inquired suppose you knew a person mr sybert who didn't care for anything but art who just wanted to have the world beautiful and nothing else what would you think not much he returned what would you i think that you go a great deal farther in the other extreme not at all he maintained i am granting that art is a very fine thing only there are so many more vital issues in life that one doesn't have time to bother with it much however i suppose it's a phase one has to go through with in italy oh i've been through with it too he added i used to feel that botticelli and giorgioni and the rest of them were really important but you got over it she inquired yes i got over it one does marcia laughed again mr sybert she said i think you are an awfully queer man you are so sort of unfeeling in some respects and feeling in others miss marcia you strike me as an awfully queer young woman for exactly the same reasons they had come to a curve in the road and under an overhanging precipice hollowed out of the rock was a little shrine to the madonna and beside it a rough iron cross some poor devil has met his fate here said sybert and he reined in his horse and leaned from his saddle to make out the blurred inscription traced on the bars felice bucconi in the year eighteen forty at this spot received death at the hand of an assassin pray for his soul he translated poor fellow it's a tragedy in italy to meet one's death at the hands of an assassin why more in italy than any other place because one dies without receiving the sacrament and has some trouble getting into heaven oh she returned i suppose when gervasio's father wished that i might die of an apoplexy he was not only damning me for this world but for the world to come exactly an apoplexy in italy is a comprehensive curse i think she commented that i prefer a religion which doesn't have a purgatory purgatory he returned has always struck me as quite superior to anything the protestants offer it really gives one something to die for i should think for the matter of that that heaven direct would give one something to die for what for instance golden paving stones eternal sunshine and singing angels oh not necessarily just those things they're merely symbolical at least said sybert perfect peace and beauty and happiness and nothing beyond you needn't tell me miss marcia that you want to spend an eternity in any such place as that it might do for a vacation a villagetura but for ever probably angels ideas of happiness are more settled than men's in that case angels must be infinitely lower than men to be happy in a place that has reached the end that stands still would require a very selfish man and i don't see why not a very selfish angel to settle down contentedly to an eternity of bliss while there's still so much work to be done in the world i suppose she suggested that when you get to be an angel you forget about the world and leave all the sorrow and misery behind a fool's paradise he maintained they were suddenly aroused from their talk by a peal of thunder they looked up to see that the sun had disappeared sybert's small cloud on the horizon had grown until it covered the sky well miss marcia he laughed i'm afraid we are going to get a wedding to pay for our immersion in philosophy and art shall we turn back if we're going to get wet anyway she said i should prefer seeing the monastery first since we've come so far she looked across the valley in front of them where not half a mile away the walls rose grim and gaunt amid a cluster of cypresses you can see about as much from here as you could if you went any nearer he returned i should advise you to look and run as he spoke a cool wind swept up the valley swaying the olive trees and turning their leaves to silver a flash of lightning followed and a few big drops splashed in their faces we're in for it marcia exclaimed as she struggled to control kentucky lil who was quivering and plunging 
Sybert glanced about quickly. The flying clouds overhead and an ominous orange light that had suddenly settled down upon the landscape betokened that a severe mountain storm was at hand. They would be drenched through before they could reach the monastery, which, after all, might not prove a hospitable order to ladies. He presently spied a low stone building nearer at hand on the slope of the hill they had just left behind. "'We'd better make for that,' he said, pointing it out with his whip. "'Though it hasn't a very promising look, it will at least be a shelter until the storm is over.'" End of chapter 12 Read by Céline Major Chapter 13 of The Wheat Princess by Jean Webster this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The drops were falling fast by the time they reached the building. They hastily dismounted and pushed forward to the wide stone archway which served as an entrance. A door of rudely joined boards swung across the opening, but it was ajar and banging in the wind. Sybert threw it open and led the horses into the gloomy interior. It proved to be a wine cellar, probably belonging to the monastery. The room was low but deep, with a dirt floor and rough masonry walls in the rear two huge vats rose dimly to the roof and the floor was scattered with farming implements the air was damp and musty and pungent with the smell of fermenting grape juice sybert fastened the horses to a low beam by means of their bridles while marcia sat down upon a plough and pensively regarded the landscape he presently joined her this is not a very cheerful refuge he remarked but at least it is drier than the open road she moved along and offered him part of her seat. "'I think I can improve on that,' he said, as he rummaged out a board from a pile of lumber and fitted it at a somewhat precarious slope across the plough. They gingerly sat down upon it, and Marcia observed, "'I suppose if you had your way, Mr. Sybert, we should be sitting on a McCormick Reaper.' "'It would at least be more comfortable,' he returned. The rain was beating fiercely by this time, and the lightning flashes were following each other in quick succession black clouds were rolling inland from across the volscian mountains and piling layer upon layer above their heads marcia sat watching the gathering storm and presently she exclaimed this might be a situation out of a book to be overtaken by a thunderstorm in the sabine mountains and seek shelter in a deserted wine cellar it sounds like one of the duchess's novels it does have a familiar ring he agreed it only remains for you to sprain your ankle she laughed softly with an undertone of excitement in her voice i've never had so many adventures in my life as since we came out to villa vivalanti marcellus and gervasio and gervasio's stepfather and now a cloudburst in the mountains if they're going to rise to a climax i can't imagine what our stay will end with henry james you know says that the only adventures worth having are intellectual adventures marcia considered this proposition doubtfully in an intellectual adventure she objected you could never be quite sure that it really was an adventure you'd always be afraid you'd imagined half of it i think i prefer mine more visibly exciting there's something picturesque in a certain amount of real bloodshed sybert turned his eyes away from her with a gesture of indifference oh if it's merely bloodshed you're after he said dryly you'll find as much as you like in any butcher's shop she watched him for a moment and then she observed i suppose you are disagreeable on purpose mr sybert you have a-she hesitated for a word and as none presented itself substituted a generic term horrid way of answering a person he turned toward her with a laugh if i really thought you meant it i should have a still horrider way certainly i mean it she declared i have always liked to read about fights and plots and murders in books i think it's nice to have a little blood spattered about it's a sort of concrete symbol of courage ah i saw a concrete symbol of courage the other day but i can't say that it struck me as attractive what was it a fellow lying by the roadside in a pool of dirty water and blood with his mouth wide open a couple of stiletto wounds in his neck and his brains spattered over his face brains may be useful but they're not pretty she looked at him gravely with a slow expression of disgust i suppose you think i'm horrider than ever now yes said marcia i do then don't make any such absurd statement as that you think bloodshed picturesque the world's got beyond that do you object if i smoke 
i don't think it would hurt this place to have a bit of fumigating she nodded permission and watched him silently as he rolled a cigarette and hunted through his pockets for a match the coat did not reward his search and he commenced on the waistcoat suddenly she broke out with what's that in your pocket mr sybert a momentary shade of annoyance flashed over his face it's a dynamite bomb it's a revolver what are you carrying that for it's against the law don't tell the police he pleaded i've always liked to play with firearms it's a habit i've never outgrown why are you carrying it she repeated sybert found his match and lighted his cigarette with slow deliberation then he rose to his feet and looked down at her you ask too many questions miss marcia he said and he commenced pacing back and forth the length of the dirt floor she remained with her elbow resting on her knee and her chin in her hand looking out at the storm presently he came back and sat down again is our amnesty off he asked before she could open her mouth to respond a fierce white flash of lightning came followed instantly by a deafening crash of thunder a torrent of water came pouring down on the loose tiles with a roar that sounded like a cannonading the air seemed quivering with electricity the horses plunged and snorted in terror and sybert sprang to his feet to quiet them jove it is a cloudburst he cried marcia ran to the open doorway and stood looking out across a storm-swept valley the water was coming down in an almost solid sheet the clouds hung low and black and impenetrable except when a jagged line of lightning cut them in two from the height across the valley the tall square monastery tower rose defiantly into the very midst of the storm while the cypress trees at its base swathed and writhed and wrung their hands in agony sybert came and stood beside her and the two watched the storm in silence there he suddenly flashed out with a little undertone of triumph in his voice there is italy he nodded toward the old walls rising so staunchly from the storm that's the way the italians have weathered tyranny and revolution and oppression for centuries and that's the way they will keep on doing she looked up at him quickly and caught a gleam of something she had never seen before in his face it was as if an internal fire were blazing through for an imperceptible second he held her look then his eyelids drooped again and his usual expression of reserve came back come and sit down he said you're getting wet they turned back to the plough again and sat side by side looking out at the storm the beating of the rain on the tiles above their heads made a difficult accompaniment for conversation and they did not try to talk but they were electrically aware of each other's presence the wild excitement of the storm had taken hold of both of them marcia's breath came fast through slightly parted lips her cheeks were flushed her hair was tumbled and there was a yellow glow in her deep grey eyes her face seemed to vivify the gloomy interior sybert glanced at her sidewise once or twice in half surprise she did not seem exactly the person he had thought he knew her hand lay in her lap idly clasping her gloves and whip it looked white and soft against her black habit suddenly marcia asked a question will you tell me something mr sybert i am at your service he bowed and the truth oh certainly the truth she glanced down in her lap a moment and smoothed the fingers of her gloves in a thoughtful silence well she said finally i don't know after all what i want to ask you but there is something in the air that i don't understand tell me the truth about italy the truth about italy he repeated the words with a slight accent of surprise last week in rome at the royston's hotel everybody was talking about the wheat famine and the bread riots and they all stopped suddenly when i asked any questions uncle howard will never tell me a thing he just jokes about it when i ask him he's afraid said sybert no one dares to tell the truth in italy it's les majesté she glanced up at him quickly to see what he meant his face was quite grave but there was a disagreeable suggestion of a smile about his lips she looked out of doors again with an angry light in her eyes oh i think you are beastly she cried you and uncle howard both act as if i were ten years old i don't think that a wheat famine is any subject to joke about miss marcia he said quietly when things get to a certain point 
if you wish to keep your senses you can't do anything but joke about them tell me she said there was a look of troubled expectancy in her face sybert half closed his eyes and studied the ground without speaking not very many days before he had felt a fierce desire to hurl the story at her to confront her with a picture of the suffering that her father had caused now he felt as strongly as her uncle that she must not know since you cannot do anything to help why should you wish to understand there are so many unpleasant things in the world and so many of us already who know about them it's he turned toward her with a little smile but one which she did not resent well it's a relief you know to see a few people who accept their happiness as a free gift from heaven and ask no questions i am not a baby i should not care to accept happiness on any such terms and you want to know about italy very well he said grimly i can give you plenty of statistics he leaned forward with his elbows on his knees and traced lines in the dirt floor with his whip speaking in the emotionless tone of one who is quoting a list from a catalogue the poor people bear three-fourths of the taxes every necessity of life is taxed bread and salt and meat and utensils but such things as carriages and servants and jewels go comparatively free when the government has squeezed all it can from the people the church takes its share and then the government comes in again with the state lotteries the latin races are already sufficiently addicted to gambling without needing any extra encouragement from the state part of the revenue thus collected is spent in keeping up the army in training the young men of the country in idleness and in great many things they would do better without part of it goes to build arcades and fountains and statues of victor emmanuel the most of it stops in official pockets you may think that politics are as corrupt as they can be in america but i assure you it is not the case in italy the priests won't let the people vote and the parliament is run in the interests of a few the people are ignorant and superstitious more than half of them can neither read nor write and the government exploits them as it pleases the farm labourer earns only from twenty-five to thirty cents a day to support himself and his family fortunately living is cheap or there would soon not be any farm labourers alive last year he paused and an angry flush crept under his dark skin last year in lombardy venetia and the marshes three of the most fertile provinces in italy fifteen thousand people went mad from hunger the children of these pellegrosi will be idiots and cripples and ten years from now you will find them on the steps of churches holding out maimed hands for coppers at this present moment there are ten thousand people in naples crowded into damp caves and cellars practically all of them stricken with consumption and scrofula and sick with hunger he leaned forward and looked into her face with blazing eyes marcia in this last week i've seen god he burst out what things i've seen he got up and strode to the door and marcia sat looking after him with frightened eyes the air seemed charged with his words she felt herself trembling and she caught her breath quickly with a half gasp she closed her eyes and pictures rose up before her pictures she did not wish to see she thought of the hordes of poor people in castel vivalanti of the bony wrinkled hands that were stretched out for coppers at every turn of the crowds of children with hungry faces she thought of the houses that they lived in wretched little dens dark and filthy and damp and it wasn't their fault she repeated to herself it wasn't their fault they were honest and frugal they wanted work but there was not enough to go around she sat quite still for several moments feeling acutely a great many things she had scarcely divined before then presently she glanced over her shoulder at the great vats towering out of the darkness behind her they suddenly presented themselves to her imagination as a symbol a visible sign of the weight of society bearing down upon the poor crushing out goodness and happiness and hope as she watched them with half fascinated eyes they seemed to swell and grow until they dominated the whole room with a sense of their oppressiveness she rose with a little shiver and almost ran to the door let's go she cried what's the matter he asked looking at her face nothing i want to go it stopped raining he led out the horses and helped her to mount what's the matter he asked again your hand is trembling did i say anything to frighten you 
she shook her head without answering and when they reached the road she drew a long breath of fresh air and glanced back with a nervous laugh i had the most horrible feeling in there i felt as if something were going to reach out from those vats and grab me from behind i think he suggested that you'd better take some of your aunt's quinine when you get home mr sybert she said presently i told you one day that i thought poor people were picturesque i don't think so any more i didn't suppose that you meant it but i did said marcia i've merely changed my mind she touched kentucky lil with her whip and splashed on ahead down the road that led to the monastery while sybert followed with a slightly perplexed frown the storm had passed as quickly as it had come loose flying clouds still darkened the sky but the heavy black thunderclouds were already far to the eastward over the apennines in its brief passage however the storm had left havoc behind it the vines in the wayside vineyards were stripped of their leaves and the bamboo poles they were trained upon broken and bent branches torn from the olive trees were strewn over the grass and in the wheat-fields the young grain was bowed almost to the ground a fierce mountain torrent poured down the side of the road through a gully that an hour before had been dry the mountain air was fresh and keen and the horses excited by the storm plunged on recklessly irrespective of mud and water they crossed the little valley that lay between the hill of the wine cellar and the higher hill of the monastery clattered through the single street of the tiny hamlet which huddled itself at the base of the hill and wound on upward along the narrow walled roadway that turned and unturned upon itself like the coils of a serpent they passed through the dark grove of cypresses that skirted the outer walls and emerged for a moment on a small plateau which gave a wide view of receding hills and valleys and hills again below them at a precipitous angle lay the valley they had just come through and the clustering brown tiled roofs of the little noah's ark village as they rode out from the shadow of the trees by a common impulse they both drew rein and brought their horses to a standstill at the edge of the grove away to the eastward the sky was black but the western sky was a blaze of orange light and the sun an orange ball was dropping into the purple campagna as into a sea the shadows were settling in the valley beneath them but the hills were tinged with a shimmering light and the tower above their heads was glowing in a sombre softened beauty they had scarcely had time however to more than glance at the widespread picture before them when they became aware of a little human drama that was being enacted under their eyes a young monk in the brown cassock of the franciscans probably a lay brother in the monastery was standing in the vineyard by the roadside resting for a moment from his task of tying up the vines that had been beaten down by the storm he had not seen the riders his back was turned toward them and his gaze was resting on the field across the way where scarlet poppies were growing among the wheat but his eyes were not for the flowers nor yet for the light on the hills beyond these he had seen before and understood he was watching a dark-haired peasant girl and a man dressed in shepherd's clothes who were strolling side by side along the narrow pathway that led diagonally through the wheat the man strong-limbed and brown and muscular in sheepskin trousers and pointed hat was bending toward her talking insistently with vehement italian gestures she appeared to listen and then she shrugged her shoulders and half drew back while her mocking laugh rang out clearly on the still evening air for a moment he hesitated then he boldly put his arm around her and the two passed down the hill and out of sight in the direction of the hamlet the poor young freight his work forgotten with hands idly hanging at his sides stared at the spot where they had disappeared and as he looked the monastery bells in the campanile above him slowly rang out the ave maria he started guiltily and with a hasty sign of the cross caught up his rosary and bowed his head in prayer at the unexpected sound of the bells the horses broke into a quick trot the monk startled at the clatter of hoofs so near turned suddenly and looked in their direction as he caught sight of marcia's and sybert's eyes upon him and knew that they had seen a quick flush spread over his thin dark face and turning away he bowed his head again marcia broke the silence with a low laugh as they rode on into the shade of the cypresses he thought we were and then she stopped lovers too said sybert poor devil i suppose he thinks the world is full of lovers outside his monastery walls there he added is a man who is living for an idea and is beginning to suspect that it is the wrong one he shot her a quick glance of comprehension 
ah oh, there's the rub he returned a trifle soberly when you begin to suspect your idea is the wrong one they rode on down the hill into the darkening valley they were going the straight way home now and the horses knew it they were still in the hills when the twilight faded and a young moon just beyond the crescent took its place riding high in a sky scattered thick with flying clouds it was a wild wet windy night though on the lower levels the roads were fairly dry the storm had evidently wasted its furies on the heights it was too fast a pace to admit much talking and they both contented themselves with their thoughts only once did marcia break the silence i feel as if we were carrying the good news from ghent to aix sybert laughed and quoted softly behind shut the postern the lights sank to rest and into the midnight we galloped abreast not a word to each other we kept the great pace neck by neck stride by stride never changing our place kentucky lil would make quite a roland he broke off she's the nicest horse i ever rode said marcia as they turned in at the villa gates she said contritely i didn't know it would take so long i'm afraid mr sybert that i've made you very late perhaps i like adventures too he smiled and you and i miss marcia have travelled far to-day end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the wheat princess this librivox recording is in the public domain as they galloped up the long avenue under the arching trees the villa presently came into view the sound of laughing voices floated out from the open windows marcia drew rein with a half involuntary cry of dismay the roystons had come i'd forgotten she explained to her companion we're giving a dinner party to-night at the sound of the clattering hoofs on the gravel of the driveway a gay group poured out on to the loggia welcoming the dilatory riders with laughter and questions and greetings my dear child where have you been here pietro call some one to take the horses is this the way you welcome guests i shall never dinner's been waiting half an hour we were beginning to think i've been worried to death you haven't caught cold have you no aunt catherine she laughed and she pulled off her gloves and shook hands with the visitors but we've been nearly drowned we should have been wholly drowned if mr sybert hadn't spied a very leaky ark on the top of a hill i'm relieved sighed her uncle as they passed into the hall i was beginning to fear that you had had a disagreement on the way and that it was another case of the kilkenny cats marcia how you look you're covered with mud cried mrs copley with a slightly apprehensive glance toward the mirror marcia straightened her hat and rubbed a daub of mud from her cheek kentucky lil and triumvirate were in too much of a hurry to get home to turn out for puddles she said how much time may we have to dress aunt catherine just fifteen minutes returned her uncle and that is a quarter of an hour more than you deserve if you are not down then we shall eat without waiting for you fifteen minutes remember cried marcia to sybert as they parted at the top of the stairs i'll race with you she added though i think myself that a girl ought to have a handicap she found granton a picture of prim disapproval waiting with her dress spread out on the bed marcia dropped into a wicker chair with a tired sigh you've ridden a long way granton remarked as she removed a muddy boot yes granton i have and dinner's already been waiting half an hour and pietro looks like a thundercloud and mrs copley looks worried and the guests look hungry what francois looks like i don't dare to think we must fly our reputations depend on it am i ready she inquired not much more than fifteen minutes later as she twisted her head to view the effect in the mirror you'll do very well said granton i'm terribly tired she sighed <sighs> and i feel more like going to bed than facing guests but i suppose in the natural order of events dinner must be accomplished first to be sure said the maid critically adjusting her train your philosophy is so comfortable granton as we have done yesterday so shall we do to-day and also to-morrow it saves one the trouble of making up one's mind she reached the salon just in time to take paul dessart's silently offered arm to the dining-room sybert did not appear until the soup was being removed he possessed himself of the empty chair beside eleanor royston with a murmured apology to his hostess it's excusable sybert said copley with a frown you should not allow a woman to beat you the furniture in that room you gave me he complained gravely 
was built as a trap for collar buttons the side of the bed comes to within three inches of the floor i couldn't crawl under what did you do eleanor royston asked i borrowed one of our hosts and i had a hard time finding it i shall put my wardrobe under lock and key the next time you visit us copley declared sybert was curiously inspecting a small white globule he found by his plate marcia laughed and called from the other end of the table it's your own prescription mr sybert drop it in your wine-glass and drink it like a man i've taken my dose during this exchange of badinage paul dessart never said a word he sat with his eyes fixed moodily on the tablecloth and one hates to say it of paul he sulked for the first time since she had known him marcia found him difficile he started no subject himself and those that she started after a brief career fell lifeless it may have been that she herself was somewhat ill at ease but in any case several awkward silences fell between them which the young man made no attempt to break mr copley would never have said of him to-night that he was an ornament to any dinner-table it fell to the frenchman across the way to keep the ball rolling in an errant glance toward the end of the table marcia saw sybert laughing softly at something eleanor had said she stayed her glance a second to note involuntarily how well they went together eleanor with her white shoulders rising from a cloud of pale blue gauze looked fair and distinguished and sybert with his dark face and sullen eyes made an aesthetically satisfying contrast he was bending toward her with an air of easy politeness that superior self-sufficiency which had always exasperated marcia so but eleanor knew how to take it she had been out nine seasons and the smile with which she answered him was quite as mocking as his own he looked to-night through and through what marcia had always taken him for the finished cosmopolitan the diplomat the diner out but he was not just that she knew she had seen him off his guard in the midst of the storm that afternoon and she was still tingling with the surprise of it she recalled what mr melville had said that afternoon in the ilex grove she was always recalling what people said about sybert the thing seemed to stick in one's mind he was a subject that gave rise to many mots you think you are very broad-minded because you see the man underneath the peasant don't you think you could push your broad-mindedness one step further and see the man underneath the man of the world she had caught a glimpse that afternoon it seemed now as if his air of super-civilization were only a mask to conceal she did not know what underneath she was searching for an apt description when she heard the young frenchman laughingly inquire mademoiselle copley est un peu distrait ce soir n'est-ce pas with a little start she became aware that some one had asked her a question for the remainder of the dinner she kept her eyes at her end of the table and exerted herself to be gracious to her taciturn companion paul's bad temper was not unbecoming and he scarcely could have adopted a wiser course marcia had expected to find him sparkling enthusiastic convincing and she had come down prepared to withstand his charm mais voilà there was no charm to withstand he was sullen moody with a frown scarcely veiled enough for politeness some one had once compared him not very originally to a greek god he looked at more than ever to-night if one can imagine a greek god in the sulks what was the matter with him marcia could only guess perhaps as his cousin had confirmed he was like a cat and needed stroking the right way of the fur at any rate she found the new mood rather taking and she somewhat weakly allowed herself to stroke him the right way by the time they rose from the table he was if not exactly purring at least not showing his claws at the royston girl's suggestion they put on evening wraps and repaired to the terrace except the two elder ladies who preferred the more tempered atmosphere of the salon mrs copley delegated her husband and sybert to act as chaperones a position which sybert accepted with a bow to the accompaniment of a slightly puzzled smile on eleanor's part she could not exactly make out the gentleman's footing in the household they seated themselves in a group about the balustrade with the exception of eleanor and sybert who strolled back and forth the length of the flagging eleanor was doing her best to-night and her best was very good she appeared to have wakened a spark in even his indifference marcia with her eyes on the two thought again how well they went together and m benoit was a second time on the verge of calling her distraite the two strollers after a time joined the group 
eleanor humming under her breath a little french chanson that had been going the rounds of the paris cafes that spring oh sing something we all know said margaret and with a laughing curtsey towards sybert she struck into fair harvard the other girls joined her their voices rising high and clear filled the night with a swinging melody it seemed strangely out of place there in the midst of the sabine hills with the old villa behind them and the roman campagna at their feet as their voices died away sybert laughed softly i swear i'd forgotten it margaret shook her head in mock reproof forgotten it she cried a man ought to be ashamed to acknowledge it if he had forgotten his alma mater song it's like forgetting his country i suspect said eleanor that it's time for you to go back to america and be naturalized mr sybert oh well miss royston he objected i suppose in time one outgrows his college just as one outgrows his kindergarten and his country marcia added as much for paul de sart's benefit as for his own margaret searching for diversion presently suggested that they visit the ghost marcia objected that the ghost was visible only during the full moon but the objection was overruled there was some moon at least and a wild night like this with flying clouds and waving branches was just the time for a ghost to think of his sins mr copley in the office of chaperon remonstrated that the grass would be damp but there were rubbers he was told marcia acquiesced in the expedition without any marked enthusiasm she foresaw a possible tete-a-tete -tete with paul de sart as they set out however she found herself walking beside m benoit with paul contentedly strolling on ahead at the side of his younger cousin while eleanor and the two chaperons brought up the rear as they came to the end of the laurel path and approached the region of the ruins margaret paused with her finger on her lips and in a conspiratorial whisper impressed silence on the group they laughingly fell into the spirit of the play and the whole party stole along with the elaborate caution of ten-year-old boys ambuscading indians the ruins in the dim light looked a fit harbour for ghosts the crumbling piles of masonry were almost hidden by the dark foliage but the empty fountain stood out clearly in a little open space between the trees the group paused on the edge of the trees and stood with eyes turned half expectantly toward the fountain as they looked they saw with a tremor of surprise the dim figure of a man rise from the coping and dissolve into the surrounding shadows for a moment no one uttered a sound beyond a quick gasp of astonishment and an excited giggle from margaret royston paul was the first to rise to the occasion with the muffled assertion that he recognized the fair and warlike form in which the majesty of buried denmark did sometime march before any of them had recovered sufficiently to follow the apparition a second ghost rose from the coping and stood wavering in apparent hesitancy whether to recede or advance this was more than tradition demanded and with a quick exclamation both copley and sybert sprang forward to solve the mystery a babble of noisy expostulation burst forth the ghost was vociferous in his apologies he had finished his work and had desired to take the air it was a beautiful night he came to talk with a friend he did not know that the signore ever came here or he would never have ventured the tones were familiar and a little sigh of disillusionment swept through the group the two men came back laughing and paul apostrophized tragically another lost illusion if all the ghosts turned out to be butlers how unromantic the world would be the young frenchman took up the tale of mourning but the true ghost monsieur le prince whom i was preparing to paint after this he will not deign to poke his nose from the grave it is an infamy an infamy he declared they laughingly turned back toward the villa and marcia discovered that she was walking beside paul it had come about quite naturally without any apparent interposition on his part but she did not doubt since he had the chance that he would take advantage of it to demand an answer and she prepared herself to parry what he might choose to say he strolled along whistling softly apparently in no hurry to say anything when he did break the silence it was to remark that the three roads were infernally noisy to-night he went on to observe that he wasn't particularly taken with her butler the fellow protested too much in the wrong place and not enough in the right from that he passed to a flying criticism of villa architecture villa vivalanti was a daisy except for the eastern wing and that was way off in style and broke the lines those gingerbread french villas at frascati he thought ought to be raised to the ground by act of parliament marcia responded rather lamely to his remarks 
as she puzzled her brains to think whether she had done anything to offend him he seemed entirely good-humoured however and chatted along as genially as the first time they had met she could not comprehend this new attitude and though it was just what she had wished for such as the contrariness of human nature she vaguely resented it had m benoit seen her just then he might have accused her for the third time of being distraite the ghost hunters upon their return shortly retired for the night as the festa a genazzano would demand an early start before going upstairs marcia waited to give orders about an open-air breakfast party she was planning for the morrow in searching for pietro she also found her uncle mr copley very stern was engaged in telling the butler that if it occurred again he would be discharged and the butler very humble was assuring the signori that in the future his commands should be implicitly obeyed uncle howard marcia remonstrated you surely aren't scolding the poor fellow because of to-night what difference does it make if he does entertain his friends in the grounds of the old villa we never go near the place it is this particular friend i am objecting to who was it gervasio's stepfather oh you don't suppose she cried that he is trying to steal the child back again i should like to see him do it said mr copley with decision he doesn't want the boy he added what he wants is money but he isn't going to get any i won't have him hanging about the place and the servants may as well understand it first as last marcia having outlined her plan for the breakfast to a somewhat unresponsive pietro finally gained her room and setting her candle down on the table she dropped into the first chair she came to with a sigh of relief that the evening was over she was tired not only in body but in mind as well the evening was not quite ended however a gentle tap came on the door and she opened it to find eleanor and margaret in loose silk dressing-gowns let us in quick said margaret we've just met a man in the hall the ubiquitous pietro shutting up windows added eleanor if i were you i'd discharge that man and get a more companionable butler it's uncanny for an italian servant to be as grave as an english one poor pietro has just had a scolding which i suppose accounts for his gravity it's funny she added that's exactly the advice that paul gave me to-night the paul was out before she could catch it and she reddened apprehensively but the girls let it pass without challenging we've come to talk said margaret possessing herself of the couch and settling the cushions behind her i hope you're not sleepy very said marcia but i dare say i shan't be ten minutes from now you needn't worry this isn't going to be an all-night session drawled eleanor from the lazy depths of an easy-chair we start at nine for the madonna's festa you'd better appreciate us now that you've got us added margaret we should by rights have slept in rome to-night how did you manage it paul took mamma down to the forum to look at some inscriptions they've just dug up and while she was gone eleanor and i scrambled around and packed the trunks for perugia by the time she came back we had everything ready to come out here and our hats on waiting to start she didn't recover her breath until we were in the train and then she couldn't say anything before mr copley when it comes to starting on journeys margaret added mamma is not what you'd call impulsive not often assented eleanor but there have been instances by the way she added i wish you'd explain about mr sybert i confess i don't quite grasp his standing in the family how do you come to be taking such lengthy horseback rides with a young man and no groom you never did that when my mother was chaperoning you no acquiesced marcia i didn't but mr sybert's a little different he's not exactly a young man you know he's a friend of uncle howard's he happened to be available this afternoon and angelo didn't happen to be so he came instead as a sort of sub-groom eleanor asked i should think he might object to the position he couldn't help himself she laughed aunt catherine forced him into it eleanor regarded marcia with a still puzzled smile you talk about mr sybert as if he were a contemporary of your grandfather how old is he may i ask i don't know he's nearly as old as uncle howard thirty-five or thirty-six i should say a man isn't worth talking to under thirty-five oh nonsense margaret objected i never heard any one in my life talk better than paul and he's exactly twenty-five paul talks words he doesn't talk ideas said her sister 
there was a pause in which eleanor leaned forward to examine some bits of green and blue iridescent glass lying in the little tray on the table what are these she inquired pieces of perfume bottles that the gravedigger in palestrina found in an old etruscan tomb there were some bronze mirrors and the most wonderful gold necklace i wanted it dreadfully but he didn't dare sell it it's gone to a museum in rome aren't these pieces of glass lovely though i'm going to have them set in gold and made into pins here's a little bottle that's scarcely broken eleanor held it up before the candle and let the light play upon its surface who do you suppose owned it before you marcia some girl who turned to dust centuries ago and her necklaces and mirrors and perfume bottles still exist what a commentary thank goodness they don't put such things in one's coffin nowadays said marcia or twenty-five hundred years from now some other girl would be saying the same of us twenty-five hundred years eleanor muttered i declare my nine seasons sink into insignificance she dropped the bottle into its tray and leaned back in her chair with a little laugh america is a bit tame isn't it after italy one doesn't get so many emotions i'm not sure but one gets too many in italy said marcia how long are you going to stay over i don't know it's so much easier not to make up one's mind i shall probably stay a year or so longer with uncle howard i like your uncle marcia he has a very taking way of saying funny things without smiling ah sighed marcia he has and as for mr sybert margaret put in mockingly i think he's about the most interesting man i've met in europe eleanor agreed imperturbably the most interesting man you've met in europe marcia opened her eyes the statement was sweeping and eleanor had had experience how do you mean she asked well said eleanor with the judicial air of a connoisseur for one thing he has a striking face i don't know whether you ever noticed it but he has eyes exactly like that portrait of filippino lippi in the uffizi i kept thinking about it all the time i was talking to him sleepy sort of italian eyes you know and an american mouth it makes an interesting combination you keep wondering what a man like that will do as marcia made no comment she continued he has an awfully interesting history we met him at a reception last week and mr melville told me all about him afterward he was born in genoa his father was united states consul and he was brought up in the midst of the excitement during the fight for italian unity politics was the air he breathed he knows more about the italians than they know about themselves he speaks the language like a native and he never oh i know what mr melville told you marcia interrupted he likes him don't most people ask your cousin about him ask mr carthrop the english sculptor ask anybody you please barring my uncle and see what you'll hear what shall i hear a different story from every person well really he's worth knowing i detest him marcia made the statement as much from habit as conviction eleanor regarded her for a moment rather narrowly and then she observed i will tell you one thing marcia copley and that is that interesting men are mighty scarce in this world i don't remember ever having met more than half a dozen and you've had experience suggested marcia nine seasons who were they the half dozen one was a kansas politician who wrote poetry a most amazing mixture of crudeness and tact remarkably bright in some ways but unexpectedly lacking in others he'd never read hamlet said he'd heard of it though another was a super civilized russian i met him in cairo he spoke seven languages and didn't find any of them full enough to express his thoughts another was the engineer suggested marcia she had heard of the engineer both from eleanor and her mother yes agreed eleanor the chief engineer on the clayton's yacht i cruised around with them two years ago on the mediterranean and the only interesting man on board was the engineer he was english and he lived in india and burma and in oh hundreds of nameless places i couldn't get much out of him at first he was pretty shy english people are you know but when he saw that one was really interested he would tell the most astonishing tales i didn't have much a chance to talk to him he didn't appeal to mamma that was one of the times that mamma was impetuous she added with a laugh 
instead of keeping on to port said with the boat we disembarked at alexandria and ran up to cairo for the rest of the winter it was there i met the russian he was stopping at shepherd's eleanor paused and her gaze became reminiscent as she sat toying with the little etruscan perfume bottle and the others marcia prompted well let me see eleanor laughed i once knew a professor of psychology in a little speck of a new england college he spent his whole life in thinking and he'd arrived at some very queer conclusions he was most entertaining he knew absolutely nothing about the world a shade of something like remorse crossed her face and she hastily abandoned the professor did i say there were any more i can't think who the fifth can be unless i include the blacksmith who married my maid i never knew him personally i merely judge from her report of him he beats her i believe when he gets angry but he's so apologetic afterward that she enjoys it if you've ever read withering heights he's exactly like heathcliff i'd really like to know him he'd be worth studying that's the trouble complained marcia if you're a man you can go around and get acquainted with any one you please whether he's a blacksmith or a prince but if you're a girl you have to wait till you're introduced at a tea and the interesting ones never are introduced at teas yes agreed eleanor that's partly true but on the other hand i think you really get to know people better if you're a girl what they're really like inside i mean men are remarkably confidential creatures did you find mr sybert confidential N no i can't say that i did he's queer isn't he you have the feeling that he doesn't talk about what he thinks about that's why i should like to know him it's not what a man does that makes him interesting it's what he thinks it's his potentialities margaret rose with something of a yawn if you're going to discuss potentialities i'm going to bed come on eleanor tomorrow's the festa of our lady of good counsel and we start at nine o'clock eleanor rose reluctantly i wish we weren't going to perugia on wednesday i should much rather stay here with marcia and mr sybert margaret laughed oh yes mr sybert eleanor acquiesced he annoys you until you get him settled he's like one of those problems in algebra suggested marcia given a lot of things to find the value of x you work it exactly right and x won't come margaret paused by the door and gathered her wrapper around her like a toga while you're talking about interesting people she threw back i know one who isn't appreciated and that's paul he's a mighty nice boy that's just what he is said eleanor a nice boy he said too good night marcia when we come back from perugia we'll sit up all night talking about interesting men it's an interesting subject end of chapter fourteen read by celine majeure